With today's farm news and information, I'm Joanna Guza. The Association of Equipment Manufacturers Futures Council spent countless hours discussing how agri the agriculture industry could be reshaped over the next 10 years. They shared an analysis of 13 trends they found that could help reshape the way food is produced. I wanted to dive into a few of these topics that sparked an interest to me, and I know that we'll you know, have an impact on America's dairy land. I'm joined with Kurt Blades. He's the Senior Vice President of Industry Sectors and Product Leadership for the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. Kurt, could you start off by giving me some more background on how this research is conducted? You bet. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, we, we represent off-road equipment uh, uh, in five sectors, ag, construction, forestry, mining, utility. And one of the things that we've been doing in 125 years of existence is providing thought leadership to the industries to help our members make sure that they are in a position to better, um, you know, make sure they have the right products or make sure that they're, they're responding to, the, to where the industry is going. So we formed uh, a Futures Council a number of years ago and uh, with this particular project, using our Futures Council and a couple of other committees, we uh, we tried to tackle the idea of what's the future going to look like in you know 10 to 20 years. And uh, through a very uh, uh, you know aggressive set of exercises, we came up with these 13 trends that really point to you know the fact that uh, agriculture is a fun time. Food production is very interesting right now, and the next 10 years are going to be wrought with some pretty exciting transformational challenges and changes that are, uh, you know, we're going to be able to take advantage of. We want to make sure our members are in our place to be able to take advantage of those changes. So we're going to be diving into some of these trends that I thought was interesting, but I wanted Kurt to kind of share what trend or trends was the most alarming or concerning to you. Well, the, when we look at the 13 trends that we we put in this white paper, the one that uh, you really you think of the discussion that was actually the most interesting to me uh, and the one that was the most surprising was the heavy focus and alignment around water scarcity. You know, I'm sitting here in the Midwest where we don't think a whole lot about water scarcity, but I know that our friends in California, our friends in Texas, uh, and, and in other parts around the world are worried about that on a daily basis. And so, you know, I think those general consensus around this group that said, that, you know, the next 10 years, we're going to really have to deal with some of the water scarcity issues. You, know, you can't grow crops without water. You can't grow fruits and vegetables without water. And so we've got to find that right balance between, um, you know, feeding our, feeding our population while also making sure that, you know, we're, we're, allowing for water to happen and development to happen in, uh, in, in, in areas uh, in cities around the world. So I think that was the most interesting one, concerning because it has pretty remarkable implications when you sort of think this through and, and pull to the eventuality of, of maybe rationed water in California. Uh, what does that mean for growing of crops and growing of our food? Well, and now I, I, I think about some of those older generations, my dad saying, hey, this will never happen. This report has been out for a few weeks. Have you gotten any pushback on certain trends? Well, I'll tell you, it's tough to uh, predict the future because you're always going to be wrong. And there's countless examples <laughs> of futurists that, it, that got it way wrong. So we're not claiming to, to, to be experts here. But what we did do and why, why we haven't got that level of pushback with this particular study is that this is truly an industry consensus. And this is a conversation document based on fact, based on on uh, things that are, uh, you know, uh, different people's uh, opinions coming together that really are, are at a seat where they see these things happening. So, uh, you know, we haven't got a lot of pushback. We've had some some good conversations about maybe your timeline is off. You know, some things mm. such as food traceability would be one where we had some uh, some conversations saying, well, you're saying in the next, you know, five, 10 years, this food traceability piece is going to be much more prevalent than it is today. And and one of the critics says, well, it's it's already here right now in some aspects, but it may never be, uh, you know, fully implemented. And so I think there's some there's some disagreement on the fringes, but I think overall, I think these mega trends are mega trends for a reason, uh, and they 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 survived the vetting process for a reason. Right, and I and I would say none of these trends were super alarming. That yeah, we've all been trickling into those into those areas. So we're talking with Kurt Blades. He's a senior vice president of industry sectors and product leadership for the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. Well, Kurt, being from America's Dairyland, um, with the increased global demand for protein, the research shows a growing opportunity for hemp milk. Can you share more details on that? 
<laughs> well, we talked about, uh, notice that our study specifically refers to a growing demand for protein, and we didn't single out animal protein uh, or plant-based protein. And there was a reason for that. And there was a lot of discussion around, you know, what, you know, we hear a lot of conversation, a lot of headlines are made about, you know, plant-based proteins, whether it's, you know, hemp or soy or, or you know, uh, uh, beyond meat or anything like that. And obviously that's get, it's garnering a lot of headlines, but I think history shows us over and over and over again, that as populations become more wealthy, they consume more protein. I think we're, we're safe to say that that trend is going to continue. What will be maybe a little bit different in the next five to 10 years is because we have the technology to introduce uh, additional alternatives that are not animal-based. That's going to be part of the mix, but I don't see animal proteins going away anytime soon. There's going to be another, a lot of new products that are on the market, uh, uh, including hemp, as you mentioned, or soybeans or other things such as that. Uh, but the, the the big trend here is that the demand for protein is going to increase and it's going to be a mix that looks a little bit different than maybe it does today. Do you think that plant or lab grown proteins will all perform animal proteins? I, I don't see solutions or scenarios where that is going to happen in the next five to 10 years. I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, you know, I think, I think the, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of attention are given to it, but at the end of the day, people do you know, sort of kind of kind of like the foods that they're used to and that taste taste particularly good. Now, economics figure into this is a whole lot of other factors that figure into that as well. And as you look at the price of food going up, you know, there may be drivers beyond uh, social consciousness that might have people adopting uh, plant based proteins. But um, I don't see a situation where they uh, outstrip animal proteins anytime in the near future. Mm hmm. Kurt, one of the other trends was a shorter supply chain, you know, and this is maybe my kind of my assumption and and you can totally tell me if I'm wrong. Is this where smaller scale farms will stay in business or will it trend towards larger operations? Uh, Yes. Uh, The answer, the answer is yes uh, to both of those. Cause I think we've, I mean, we found that, and we see it around, certainly around urban areas that uh, uh, smaller farms and uh, you know, wanting, you know, growing demand for, uh, for, things to be as local as they possibly can be make a whole lot of sense. And that shorter supply chain also makes a whole lot of sense because you're removing some of the transportation elements that are that are very real. So that's part of it. The other part of it, you can connect this with a, with a different trend that we talk about, which is, uh, you know, different business models that exist. And I love to think about the future that involves uh, vertical farming and other mm-hmm. growing techniques. And so you, know, you can think about lettuce as, let's use lettuce as an example. Does it make a lot of sense for us to grow a crop that is mostly water and ship it thousands of miles to end up on a restaurant plate in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, when you can get the same thing grown uh, in a vertical farm, maybe on the rooftop of a building in an urban setting. Uh, just the economics of that and the technology is caught up to where that shortened supply chain uh, matters. And I think we'll continue to see that to see that uh, trend continue, certainly on those vegetables uh, from a transportation standpoint. But you could also see the no- the amount of dollars that are being pushed into the uh, uh, the, the meat processing industry, specifically supporting smaller uh, meat packing industries from the from USDA, that uh, tends to uh, is going to you know, kind of support some of those those local and regional processing. So again, it's shortening that supply chain uh, to to really respond to what consumer needs are, but also respond to sort of the economic realities of transportation uh, and uh, trying to create food with a smaller uh, carbon footprint. You know, when we look at some of these vertical farming practices and kind of changing up this question, Kurt, (laughs) what about, though, I've heard of like energy use, that these these vertical farming facilities just require so much energy. Is that is that going to be a problem with that being, you know, the angle that people want to go, but there's not enough power and energy to to do it? (laughs) Oh, that's a whole different debate. We start talking about how do you, you know. How do you fund these things? How do you power these things? What I can say is that the technology around vertical farming is changing so quickly. Uh, I mean, let's just think back in the last you know 20 years, we wouldn't have dreamed of any of these things that that were even having having listed as a as a significant trend because we didn't have the LED technology to mimic sunlight. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. we have that availability, and you know when you have an LED technology that uh, can be com- 
you know, controlled wirelessly and has some artificial intelligence built into it, it only makes sense for us to get better and better at that. And that includes being more energy efficient. So yeah, in the short run, I think there's a, there's a very strong argument that yeah, it may not pay off uh, from an energy consumption standpoint, but make no mistake, um, innovation is not stopping today. It's going to continue on. And so I fully expect some of these uh, things like vertical farming and some of the other practices that we're talking about, they're going to be, they're going to be part of our future, whether it's five years from now, 10 years from now, or 30 years from now, uh, they're clearly coming this direction because the technology is catching up. Right. And that's, that's just one hurdle over the multiple wins we might have with vertical farming. Exactly. Now, Kurt, talking about some of those geographic shifts. So mm -hmm. they say that our corn belt, everything might be going up. Some of our Southern states are going to have to find, you know, double cropping practices. Mm -hmm. The big question is, is can infrastructure keep up with that shift if we're going to be changing where mm -hmm. corn and wheat and all that is grown? So that's a great question. And I'll tell you, we have a rich history of that happening in our food production system in the United States. I, I live in Iowa uh, and where I live in, in Iowa, you know, the whole grain infrastructure was built around uh, train facilities, feeding feedlots in Texas and 100 car, 100 car uh, train units with grain shipped to Texas. Well, ethanol comes into the market 20 years ago in a big way and totally shifts the dynamics. Well, the infrastructure followed. The infrastructure follows the economics. So, yeah, mm -hmm. do we have the infrastructure today to have the, the, the Corn Belt exist in you know, northern Wisconsin? Probably not. Uh, but if the economics are there, the infrastructure will follow. Right. So we know customers want to know where their food comes from. And we, you know, we talk about transparency. Can you paint a picture of what this will look like for customers and what farmers should be, would be expected to do? Well, again, it goes back to technology. Um, the things that, you know, I think farmers, it, consumers always want to know where their food comes from. Every good consumer wants that traceability. And frankly, every good farmer wants to tell their story. We haven't had the technology to allow that to happen in a very efficient way until really recently. So when you talk about food traceability, I mean, farmers are keeping very good records of the great things they're doing on the land today, gr using modern technology to grow crops in the most sustainable way that they can and that they have for centuries. Um, so that traceability uh, story uh, you know, you have to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations historically with a farmer. And because of this commodity market, you kind of lose a little bit of that. Well, now all of a sudden, we've got some technology, whether it's blockchain uh, or other distributed technologies that allows that traceability to happen and that record keeping uh, to happen in a way that was never possible heck, five years ago, uh, just because it would take way too much computing power. I see that happening in a very big way. So what does this mean to farmers? The really exciting thing about this for farmers is that farmers are already collecting that data. I mean, tractors and combines are data harvesting machines. And the only way this transparency and this traceability is going to work in a meaningful way is if it doesn't disrupt the current production practices. And I think mm -hmm. we're we're just right on the cusp of seeing, hey, we can we can provide it's not it's not do things the way you've always done them or collect data, I think the answer is produce really good crops. And while you're at it, you're going to be collecting data. But it's a it's kind of a hands off process that just sort of happens in the background. Right. And I think we already are consuming so much data. We're going to need to be hiring people to review that data. <laughs> oh, yeah, but, but. What that means. So, Kurt, now transitioning, talking about some of those emission regulations. Can you tell me more about the direction of Costco and Walmart and where they're heading? And will biofuels grow or electric farm equipment? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we've got a lot of ways to go uh, with the current technology to continue. I mean, we've made tremendous improvements, whether it's the tier four engine that's, you know, available for sale right now or additional power uh, power that's out there. I mean, the, the industry continues to be uh, efficient uh, and find ways to be better. Uh, so we got a long way to go with the existing technology. And yeah, will there be electric tractors and combines? Absolutely. Um, when the technology catches up, uh, there's no one single silver bullet that's going to take a, a you know, one piece of technology is going to trans transition to another. But we know that that there's enough environmental 
uh, concern. There's enough focus on emissions that that we will find a way uh, to, to 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 put to put the right mix of of uh, of, of, of power out there, power solutions out there, whether it's solar or, or diesel and turtle combustion engines, or it's a, um, you know, electric or hydrogen fuel cells. Um, now, what does this mean to the consumer companies? You mentioned Costco and some others. Obviously, those uh, consumer packaged good companies and retailers are making pledges. And we're in the food production industry, so we got to be very responsive to what those needs are. Uh, but I'd also think that our job is to need to have open dialogues with folks uh, that are that are trying to make a difference like this. We say, hey, we're with you. We want to reduce our carbon footprint, reduce our our uh, our footprint on the earth as much as as much as you do, because that's what we've been doing for centuries. Um, but don't prescribe a system. Let us come up with a system that works for all of us together and find that right balance. And that's where where we as AEM are trying to work. And I think that's absolutely where our manufacturers are having those conversations with farmers and also with consumers today. Right. I've heard uh, in my previous role, boots on the ground, the people that are doing the actions need to be coming up and working with those regulators to get to get something across, because if the people that are in DC or Madison that are trying to accomplish this, they're not the ones that are living it every day. And no. Kurt, I know we're short on time, so I want to get to the last two questions because or last two questions I had for you. Can you share more about the farm ownership models and what new business models will emerge? Because this is really interesting to me. Well, here, here's just the reality of farming today. As we all know, it is a capital intense business. It's capital intense business because land is expensive and a lot of it's multi-generational land. Equipment is expensive and that. You, know, you have to have a lot of cash to put that forward. As land ownership uh, evolves, largely because it's been family held, a lot of times it's in trust, and there's kind of weird phone ownership uh, situations for for most of the farmland around uh, around the nation today. Uh, it it only goes to say that that there will be new business models that exist. Uh, I use my own family farm as an example, where where historically the family farm owned the land, the family farm owned the equipment, and the family farm ran the business as a farm mm -hmm. every every year. Um, what we have done now, for tax reasons and for other other reasons that just made sense from a generational transfer standpoint, we've actually have, have decoupled that land from the farm business. And that's happening over and over and over again out there, whether it's for tax reasons or for inheritance reasons or for mm -hmm. business continuity reasons, but that changes things. So if you are a, 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 a family farming operation that has, has uh, you know, maybe been able to operate uh, some years on, on feast years and some years on famine years, but you always have that land asset to kind of keep you along, that, that ownership uh, uh, situation is changing. That business model is changing a little bit. And I think we're going to begin to see that really uh, take hold in the next five to 10 years, where you look at how that, that business model is changing a little bit. That's going to affect farmers' decisions on how they purchase their inputs, even how they invest in their capital equipment, and maybe even how they take care of the land to begin with. Mm -hmm. That'll be interesting to see what happens. Again, this isn't a, an immediate change, but the aging of the population and the aging of the ownership of the land is is simply pointing out that this transfer is happening right now. Right. And Kurt, I know you got to get going, but you're a wealth of knowledge. So I need to get this last point from you. So there's people that are, are following these trends. What could be some factors that hold back these trends that all of a sudden derail it, that it's not going to happen? I mean, I can think of regulation, another pandemic. What, what are some other trends or factors that you think could impact them? Well, I just shuddered a little bit when you said another pandemic. Please, please don't say that again. Uh, but I, I do think that the pandemic brought a lot of attention uh, to the food sector. And, mm -hmm. and with that attention comes investments. It comes additional scrutiny for regulation. Um, some of these trends, there's, there's not a whole lot that's going to slow down these macro trends that we point to. But there are some things that could accelerate them. And one of those that we as AEM have been a big advocate for is rural broadband. And there's so many times throughout this present, throughout this white paper, and whenever even our conversation here, we talk about, you know, innovation and technology. The only reason that this technology can see the light of day and the only way it can really um, live up to its full potential is when we have rural broadband and specifically mm -hmm. wireless broadband in field. 
So that's a limiting factor. Uh, that's the biggest limiting factor. Another limiting factor is going is labor. Uh, labor is also a catalyst to cause more innovation to happen because we had to deal with mechanization to address labor issues. But from a um, uh, being able to work on the machines or being able to, uh, you know, service uh, machines at the local level and that level of technology so sophistication, it's very real. So that is another limiting factor that could derail some of this um, a little bit. I wouldn't say derail, but probably slow down the adoption of things. And then obviously, uh, I, I will say that there's always a back, black swan event out there. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we live in a time where where there is some some real challenges on a global basis, geopolitical issues. So you don't know what that means, um, but that could change everything tomorrow. The right. fundamental and truths are going to continue to be there. Just the implementation may change a little bit. We're talking with Kurt Blades. He's the senior vice president of the industry sector and product leadership for the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. We appreciate your time and your research that you've put into this. I mean, this is what's going to help us be innovators for the future. So thank you so much for your time, Kurt. You bet. Thank you. And please go to AEM.org to learn more about this study. Perfect.